welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for the Australia and New Zealand market update. Um, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are, or good afternoon. I think we have all time zones here today. Um, we're really excited about doing this market update. It is the third one that we are doing in preparation of the Asia and Pacific B2Bs that we will have in December. So thank you again. We're really excited to have um, our team member, Joe, give an update on Australia and New Zealand, and as well as our amazing four panelists that you will hear from later today. Um, we have Monique Ruiz from the US Commercial Service. We've got Jody Teakin from Qantas Airline, Tim Holland from Flight Center, and Paula Watson from House of Travel. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and coming and talking to our US partners because we're super excited that Australia and New Zealand is opening up slowly, state by state, right, Joe? But we're getting there. Um, as all of you know, the US never are close to Australia and New Zealand, but they weren't allowed out. <laughs> so it's like Joe was saying, it was Fort Knox for a while, but we are opening up and we're very excited to get the Aussies and Kiwis back to the US. Um, so again, I wanna thank the panelists, I wanna thank Joe, and of course, Brian for helping this set, set us up and Jackie, um, couldn't do any of this without you, so thank you for helping us. Um, so I'm just going to hand it uh, immediately over just so that we can get started because I know we'll have great questions and conversations at the end. Please feel free to type in your questions in the chat or Q&A box, but we won't address them until the end of the presentation. Um, other than that, please make sure you mute yourself, um, otherwise I will be going around muting you. But other than that, thanks Monique for joining us and I will hand it straight over to you. All right, hello um, everyone. So the US Commercial Service, a US Department of Commerce agency is here to assist US destinations and travel suppliers attract international visitors. We have offices throughout Australia and New Zealand. And we're pleased to work with and support Brand USA and the local travel industries to welcome back Australian and New Zealand visitors to the United States. Welcome them back to your destinations and to your businesses. Historically, Australia has always been an important source of international visitors to the United States and has consistently ranked in the top 10 inbound markets. In 2019, Australia was the ninth largest source of international visitors. 1.3 million Australians visited the United States and spent $8 billion. Together, the Australian and New Zealand markets sent 1.6 million visitors in 2019, with a total spend of 9.5 billion. The United States is the most popular long haul destination for Australia and New Zealand travelers, and the third most popular destination for Australians after New Zealand and Indonesia. Australian and New Zealand visitors stay an average of three weeks and travel to the US throughout the year. Um, a third of Australian and New Zealand visitors rent a car, they are active travelers, mostly independent FIT travelers and engage in a wide variety of outdoor activities, sightseeing, shopping and dining. They do things and spend money. They travel throughout the United States from the West Coast to the East Coast and down South. They typically visit 2.3 cities and two states. Uh, popular states include California, Hawaii, New York, Nevada, Florida, and Texas. Importantly, they are repeat travelers. Over 75% of Australian and New Zealand visitors are repeat travelers. So that was just a brief uh, market overview from me. We look forward to working with you to welcome back the Aussie and the Kiwi visitor. And please let me know if there's anything we can do to assist you. Thank you so much, Monique. That's a beautiful welcome. G'day, kia ora to you all. My name's Joe Palmer and I'm the director for Brand USA across Australia and New Zealand. I'd also like to introduce you, sorry, that was Monique's picture there, my picture. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce you to my colleague, Tori Goddard, who's our public relations director for Brand USA in Australia and New Zealand. And we're both so pleased to welcome you today to be here as your in-market Brand USA team to support your efforts to bring this market back as quickly as possible. It's so lovely to see you all and thank you so much for your interest in this really important market. What a fascinating, challenging, crazy time we're all living through and what excellent timing for us to be reconnecting today. 
I'm really excited to talk you through the journey we've been on down under and to give you an update on the current situation in Australia and New Zealand, now that we're opening up to the United States and indeed to the world again. The COVID story in Australia and New Zealand has been one of extremes. We've done extremely well in terms of minimising lost lives, um, but it's been extremely hard for the travel industry as, it, as this has involved having borders slammed shut. But now, finally, after countless sleepless nights, redundancies, furloughs, planning and replanning, doing and undoing, I'm so pleased that we can finally say the next chapter has definitely begun. We're currently hurtling from the extreme lows of closed borders toward our next extreme, a positive one, the rebound. With both nations' economies doing well and over 80%, over 80% of both po populations fully vaccinated, with the promise of 90% vaccination on the near horizon. The purpose of this presentation is really to help you understand where we're currently at and what's likely to happen from here. We wanna give you an understanding of the current state of the industry and media, the sentiment of the people, the economy, and other factors that will shape the rebound. Let's take a deep breath and a closer look at the path Australia has traveled to arrive at the present moment. For much of the pandemic, the aim in Australia has essentially been suppression of the virus, pushing towards COVID zero. That's obviously only possible because we're an island nation. We've had super strict, strict lockdowns when there have been outbreaks. We were slow on the vaccine rollout and there was a frustrating lack of dialogue about navigating a pathway forward into a new normal. I know all of you were probably scratching your head, just not really able to comprehend this really sort of full on approach to just slamming borders shut and, and, be, and being so strict with everything. And trust me, I hear you. <laughs> but, while for our, um, but while for the travel industry, this restriction of movement was a complete disaster, for the rest of the population, the reality is it actually meant that the everyday impact of COVID was, was relatively minimal, um, at least until the Delta variant arrived. Yes, there were spot lockdowns to contend with, um, and um, our, our friends in Victoria, one of our states in Australia, had an extended lockdown, but really for the most part, life has been pretty normal. We didn't have the restrictions imposed in many parts of the world, um, and our economy has been faring well. As Delta arrived on our shores, the futility of a suppression strategy became evident, and this also coincided with the, with the arrival of the bulk of our vaccine supplies. Finally, in this situation, in August, Australia laid out a national plan. The plan stated that once 80% of Australians had been double vaccinated, we could begin to open up. The narrative quickly began to change and the dialogue rapidly turned towards vaccination as our way out and learning to live with COVID going forward. Thank goodness, seriously, it took way, way too long for that conversation to go in that direction. And finally, we were making sense. The rolling out of this national plan had real impact. Conversations were changing, people were thinking differently, and we knew things were finally turning when Qantas then launched their heart-wrenching brand campaign, breaking months on the end of silence. As I'm saying that and introducing it, I'm realizing I didn't do um, I didn't do what I had to do to share the sound. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment so that I can turn the sound on here. I apologize. Just one moment. Where am I? How do I do this? Oh my goodness. Ah, here we go. Stop share and then I reshare. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Look, yeah, I'm gonna see you soon. Okay. Love you. Is that you, Mum? It's a younger version of me. <laughs> Mum, can we go to Disneyland? I've been on my own for a minute. Is it only me out here? Searching for the place to begin to. Is it me? Is it you? Is it me? Bloody expired. 
So where are you headed? Singapore for a wedding. Taking the kids to Disneyland Resort. London. Gonna see someone very special to me. Hey guys. <laughs> Fun you drew. Try to stop us. <laughs> ah, that's the spirit. Cause I had a dream that someday I would just fly, fly away. Today. Here comes the bride. I've got just the place. So I had to dream that I'd just fly away, away. What a start, Jimmy. Take off. What would take you off? We'll be there soon. So I had a dream that I just fly away. Uh, this ad had the whole nation weeping. I was sitting on my couch when it came on and I literally had tears rolling down my face. I was texting friends going, have you seen the Qantas ad? It was the first piece of inspiration that we had seen for 18 months and it was desperately needed. Then let me just get down to this next slide. Where is it going? I'll have to go back to that again. I'm sorry, guys. It's okay, Joe. It's giving us all time to recover, <laughs> come to our senses. <laughs> Excellent. Here we go. Very soppy. <laughs> right? I know. Beautiful. Here we go. Okay. So after that ad was launched and the national plan was rolled out, just a few short weeks later, the moment we had all been waiting for, 560 days, 560 days after closing the Australian borders off to the world, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced that we will have reached the 80% vaccination rate in New South Wales and Victoria by November. And so we would indeed begin to lift international travel restrictions. Within an hour of that announcement, Qantas announced earlier dates for the recommencement of the international routes, bringing forward the start date from late December to mid-November. And from there planning to incrementally build out their international network again over the following months. And then just a few weeks after this, their launch dates were brought forward even closer to November the 1, November the 1, November the 1st. Now, what's really interesting is that Australians and New Zealanders have actually never been banned from the US because we never presented a significant COVID risk. So while all the focus for you guys has been on the US beginning to open again on, from November the 8th, Australians actually started holidaying back in the US an entire week earlier than that, from November 1st. Two weeks prior to the November 1st flight, we had another extreme win. The New South Wales government announced the abolishment of quarantine requirements for return travellers. Now quarantine was obviously a major deterrent, so removing this requirement immediately made travel infinitely more attractive. A week later, the Victorian government followed suit. At that time, the federal government also lifted the capacity restrictions on planes, which had been imposed throughout the pandemic, effectively making flying immediately more profitable for the airlines and in dramatically increasing available seats. So really, since the end of August, when the national plan was laid out, there's been an extremely speedy road to opening up, and we have now arrived. To be completely fair, not all of Australia has yet opened up. One thing the pandemic has demonstrated to us is the incredible power really of state governments. They hold a lot more autonomy over their regions than we had realized. And so while, federal governments while the federal government has removed all restrictions, states still have their own decision-making abilities. So currently this map shows you, you know, the map of Australia and the various states. The dark blue, New South Wales, Australian Capital Territory and Victoria are open already. This re represents 60% of our population. Another 10% of the population is made up by the Northern Territory, South Australia and Tasmania. And those states haven't quite yet reached the 80% vaccination rate, which is when they will open. And then the final 30% of the population, Queensland and Western Australia, these states have set more ambitious targets for opening. They need 90% vaccination rates, which we think is likely to be achieved in January. 
But the fact is that historically, the three states that represent the biggest number of travellers to the US, New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, two of those three powerhouses have already opened and the, the third, Queensland, is likely to open in January. So that's the great news in Australia. Now, how about New Zealand? Well, New Zealand has run a very similar process than Australia, but probably more extreme. They've done even better with keeping the virus out. And for the most part, other than borders being closed, life has been normal. But again, the combination of the Delta variant and the availability of vaccines has finally also led them to changing their strategy from suppression to learning to live with the virus. In September, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced their plan to reach 90% vaccination rates and thereby achieve herd immunity in order to open up. The likely timeframe that this will be achieved is January. At this stage, there'll still be a quarantine upon return, but various tests are being done and it's expected that by the time borders do open, that this will be done away with. Air New Zealand have already shown their commitment to their international routes. Um, they are flying already to the US, but carrying Australians, so Sydney, Auckland, Los Angeles, um, and they plan to open this route up to Kiwis on the 1st of February. Now, I know for many of you, thinking about 80 and 90% vaccination targets seems ludicrous, um, but our country is a small in population and surprisingly compliant. Last week, both countries reached a milestone of 90% of our populations having had our first dose. So it may well be the most vaccinated region in the world. And of course, you don't take your first dose if you're not going to take your second dose, or at least I wouldn't have thought so. Um, so the, the great part about this is that when arrivals into the US are limited to those who have only been double vaccinated, essentially that means our entire country is able to travel. There's not going to be that restriction. So my dear friends, Australia is open. We opened for the majority of our population on November 1, marking the end of 20 months of closed borders with New Zealand and the rest of the Australian states to follow early next year. I know this lasted much, much longer than anyone wanted or could have possibly anticipated, but we're finally in the thick of the rebuild. Our phones are ringing, our inboxes are full, um, our heads are exploding um, as everybody's been onboarded back into roles and making plans. It's, it's, it's truly on um, and a very exciting time. And as you know, and as Monique explained, these two nations punch well above their weight in terms of outbound travel. With 20, day, 20, day and 20 days of annual leave, wealthy populations and an international heritage, our countries exhibit amongst the world's highest propensities to travel internationally. Economically, both countries are in a great place. Both economies have fared very well throughout the pandemic, buoyed by extensive governance spending, um, and Australians holding nearly $2 billion in travel credits and having an unprecedented level of personal savings. All of this, of course, provides a great foundation for the rebound of travel once confidence is re-established. And I like to joke that Australian and New Zealand pent up demand is better than everybody else's pent up demand because A, of the um, great economic foundations, but B, because we have been starved of travel, not just to the USA, but literally to everywhere. For nearly 20 months, um, other than a few months where borders were open between Australia and New Zealand, we literally have not been able to go anywhere. Even within Australia, currently even as we speak, um, there's been restrictions between states. So as these travel loving countries, um, we just seriously, we've got the cash, we have the starvation of travel and we can't wait to get into it again. Confidence rebuilding is, is essentially the only hurdle that we have here. So what will be important to people when they travel? Well, based on consumer sentiment studies, as well as extrapolating the trends that were in place prior to COVID, here are the trends we're seeing. Luxury travel, this is obviously a global trend. You've heard about this, I'm sure, from many places across the globe, but it's certainly also prevalent down under. Those who can afford it are splurging and wanting to ensure they secure the best possible experiences that they've been missing out on for so long. Wellness, nothing drives the demand for wellness-based travel like a global pandemic. And likewise with wide open spaces. 
national parks and outdoor experiences are high on the agenda. And as has been the case for quite some time now, living like a local is what people are up for. They want to immerse themselves in local cultures with the emphasis on small groups and high impersonalization. And across all of these trends, um, a big reason for travel is connection. People are wanting to make up for lost time, all the lost birthdays and anniversary celebrations and time with friends and family. The USA obviously caters in spades to all of these trends. And we look forward to working with you all to bring the possibilities to life for the Australian and New Zealand market. So now to take stock of what, is, what has happened to our partners and stakeholders in market. Where are we? How has the industry fared? Let's start with the travel media. For months and months, we struggled to get any positive attention at all. Once the initial dreaming phase wore off, media titles had very little appetite for travel. And as a consequence, our journalist friends and travel titles were hugely impacted by the pandemic. Advertising dollars obviously nosedived and the public, public narrative was guided by the news cycle, leaving travel stories for the most part feeling inappropriate. A number of travel publications shut down altogether, while the volume of content within those remaining shrank significantly. We estimate the overall volume of travel related content reduced by 80%. As a result, freelancers were out of work, many editorial store staff were stood down or found themselves writing in new areas and travel star stories were very hard to come by. However, what an instant turnaround we have experienced in Australia, instant. As soon as that announcement was made that the borders are opening, it just skyrocketed. The travel me media has done a complete 180 degree turnaround. We're all stretching to meet the demand for content and news. Advertising dollars are catapulting and tra travelers are hungry to plan again. The ramp up's happening. Of course, it's not going to be all smooth sailing as the media, uh, media boost travel content to meet demand. Staff need to be onboarded again. And of course, we need to really start driving the most powerful tool for quality coverage, which is of course, media fans. So that all takes a little while. Of course, there's also an immediate explosion of competition as literally every destination buys to carve out their portion of the recovery. Airlift is obviously vitally important to the travel rebound and naturally capacity was drastically impacted during the pandemic when only travel deemed essential was allowed. But we're really lucky that now with borders open, all the airlines except Virgin Australia that had flown previously to the US um, had either never stopped flying, are now back or are imminently starting back. And while not all the routes have yet been restored, each of the airlines has stated their intention to rebuild that footprint that they had prior to the pandemic. Obviously, it's quite a process to get capacity back to where it was, and it's not going to happen overnight. Staff need to be rehired and trained, and whole ecosystems need to be redeveloped. The coming months will see airlines ramp up their presence again, presence and services again, initially consolidating traffic from across the country through Sydney and then also through Melbourne. And over time, they will continue to increase frequencies and build out their routes to meet demand. If we take Qantas, for example, prior to the pandemic, they had flights leaving Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane going into five gateway cities. Currently, their flights run only between Sydney and Los Angeles, but they'll build this out to include Melbourne, San Francisco and Dallas-Fort Worth in the first quarter of next year and then continue to build out beyond that. There's also been a lot of talk about price. So the current flight prices are admittedly quite expensive, but if we think about it, we're basically going into the peak season. So that was always the case. We did a quick search last week, um, nothing overly technical about this, just quickly looked up, you know, what flights would cost. And they're actually re really reasonable when we look at May next year. Um, so I think, airlines are definitely coming to the party and doing their part to generate that demand. And then finally, on to our travel distribution networks. Um, the travel industry has gone through huge crisis and upheaval throughout the pandemic. So let's look at where we've landed. Well, there's no question that there's been an enormous impact on the industry with massive resource losses. Within the retail sector, about a third of the industry has been wiped out with 15,000 travel agency jobs disappearing in Australia, and similarly, around a third of the industry in New Zealand. Many agents are still underemployed or juggling multiple jobs. 
Still others have moved to a mobile travel agent mo uh, model where they're essentially continue to service their closest clients and become their own small business with the flexibility to work the hours that suit them. However, when it's all said and done, and despite a number of companies disappearing altogether, our biggest players across both retail and wholesale are still in place. And you'll be hearing from a number of them later on as they take a deeper dive into their individual situations um, and share their strategies to rebuild their US business. The upshot of the massive upheaval in the retail segment is that there are many, many less agents, but those who remain tend to be the more quality agents, the business owners, the educated, the hugely passionate ones, and the ones with their own very well established client bases. Many of the agents in this category have moved on to the mobile structure, as I mentioned, working independently from home and catering directly to their own client base. There will of course be a big challenge in the coming six months for retailers coping with the volume of work as agencies try to desperately recruit agents back into the industry or train new people up. Just today I saw there's a government initiative that are literally rolling out free education um, on, on teaching people how to be travel agents to try to really up, uh, up the up the population of travel agents um, as quickly as possible. Um, and even of course, for those agents who have been in the industry for a long time, each client is so much more time consuming for them now with so many moving parts with regards to protocols, rules and procedures. It's a bit of a nightmare and it's certainly a maze um, and everything that we can do or anything that we can do to help make that easier will put us all in good stead. However, with all the challenges that travel agents face, um, there is a silver lining of this crazy COVID situation, and that is um, that there is certainly now a really, really clear um, additional value add that agents provide in helping customers to help navigate this new world of travel. From a marketing perspective, literally all the major travel companies are in extensive planning for major campaign activity. I've never felt more popular having people calling and saying, what can we do with Brand USA? Yes, everyone has pressure on budgets, and yes, they're all challenged as they ramp up before the cash flow has started, um, but the energy has returned in spades and the great race is on to reignite the market and capture market share. And we've had a great response from the market to sign up for the Brand USA one-on-one -on -one meetings in December on the Global Marketplace platform. I think many of you are participating in this already, um, and I believe there's still a day or so for you to be able to register and, and lock in meetings if you would like to. So. Certainly, to, you can do so by going to the Global Marketplace platform. So now let's look into the future. We need to rebuild the market, of course. A market with a solid economic foundation and a strong history of travel to the US. You all want to know how quickly will this rebound? You want to know what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and what can we all do to stimulate the market as quickly as possible? From a consumer sentiment perspective, Brand USA conducted our last study in just October, just as things were starting to get much more optimistic. The study surfaced a few salient points that I'd like to share. So firstly, it's obvious that intention to travel internationally has been down on previous years as this slide shows. But what you can see is from August, which is that third to last green bar, um, which is when the national plan was rolled out, um, we quickly became much more likely to travel internationally. By October, the likelihood to travel was only 20% down on pre-pandemic levels. And at that, that time, the borders were still closed. So definitely since then, um, the, the desire to travel and the likelihood to travel has increased even more. There's definite pent up demand, and there's no question that it's all about building back confidence and just helping people to feel like, yes, I can do this and it's not gonna be a big drama. We've all experienced, I'm sure that you have, but I think potentially even much more so in Australia, we've experienced so much uncertainty and constant change around travel. Literally everybody has experienced booking and cancelling travel and the enormous hassle that goes with this. So even as I said, interstate travel, we've booked and then we couldn't travel. We had to undo it. And there's so much hassle involved with that, that it's made people potentially a little bit gun shy. We're really unsure of what the new travel world looks like. So this is where our work lies. There's two prongs for us all. 
We need to be, be aggressively building up positivity and awareness again, inspiring people. For months and months, we've had nothing but negativity and we just want to bring the life back to travel and that, that desire. And equally as important is we need to be demonstrating as rapidly as we can that we're normalising, that it's not too complicated and that it will be fun. When you look at this slide here, this shows when people think they will travel. And you can see that while people are wanting to travel immediately, it sort of peaks in about a year's time. Uh, in talking with retailers, this is what's happening as well, that the bookings are actually strong and thick, but it's sort of from July onwards. And that's, I think, a representation of people sort of wanting the guinea pigs to go through first so they understand what it will look like. So I think it's really important that with such a long break and many paradigm changes along the way, we recognise that selling international travel is essentially like launching a brand new product. Travel genuinely is not going to be the same. And I know that breaks all of our hearts. We're hoping that we can make it as much like it was as possible. And of course, our communication around that is going to be really, really important. There are some people, the innovators, the early adopters, who just can't wait to get out and they're just they're just doing it. And, and we're seeing that, you know, flights to the States are booked out for December, which is fantastic. Um, but there's absolutely no doubt that the complexity of vaccination requirements, not just for the US, but around the world that we're navigating at the same time, processes and protocols need to be addressed as part of the education process around this new product we call international travel. This information and education will be required to overcome hesitancy and build confidence. Who will be the early movers? Well, our research shows us that these are the three key segments. Obviously, the via far market, visiting friends and relatives, they want to reconnect with people that they haven't seen for nearly two years. Beyond that, um, definitely travellers without children will come back faster than those with. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. The vaccination pathways for children are slower. Um, and also kids have had a lot of time homeschooling. So parents are more reluctant to take them out of school. So we're really then restricted just to the school holiday periods. Um, and just in general, I think that whole, you know, let the guinea pigs go first mentality will um, slow down the family market. But certainly the statistics on search are showing um, that those early in the careers and empty nesters are hungry to travel. And even more so than normal, the high income earners are indexing really high. Um, yeah, so beyond this first segment of travellers though, we really do have lots of work to do together. Right now in my conversations with retailers, they just want us to generate confidence in the travel process. They want us to get the message out they want us to get the first wave of travellers travelling and sharing their stories. As Brand USA, we're engaging a well-known media personality who I can't quite announce yet, but we're on the brink as a spokesperson to showcase how simple the process of travelling to the USA is, and we hope to make that announcement shortly. On the PR side, we're working as hard as we can to get those first travel stories out there, and we're, getting, we're, we're talking with travel agents to help facilitate you know, trips and just, again, get that message out there. We want to flood people's inboxes with, hey, I'm traveling, look how easy this is, look how fun this is, um, and just really help to build the normality and the confidence around it again. So what are the requirements in traveling to the USA? Well, there's pretty much three, three key steps. It's not that challenging. The ESTA, we had to do that before anyway, so we need to get ourselves an ESTA. We need to prove that we've got double dose expect double dose of vaccination. As you've already heard, you know, Australia and New Zealand have had 90% of the population already with the first dose. So that's not going to be a challenge. And then we have to provide proof of a pre-departure negative viral test within three days of leaving. So that's not so big a deal. It's new, but it's not so big a deal. Overall, especially when you compare some of the challenges and the hoops that you've got to jump to to go through um, jump through to go to places like Fiji or Singapore, it's, it's positive news for us here. The, the requirements to travel to the US really are a lot more simple than uh, many other places. Um, but on the downside, it does add significant cost still. You know, you've got the tests themselves. You'll have increased, obviously, um, insurance costs. Um, and there's still no doubt that there's uncertainty, pressures, challenges, 
hesitancy, just, you know, confusion and gray area. And that's obviously our job is to really try to get rid of that gray area and that confusion as quickly as we possibly can. So are people actually traveling? Are people buying? Um, how is that looking? Well, my friends from Expedia shared with me this data and I hope you can see it. I know those lines are very thin. They shared this from me um, for the eight weeks of search leading up to last week um, for Australian search and bookings. This is over the last 18 months. So you can see that from when the national announcement was made, the national plan was made um, in August, there's been a steep incline in both search and bookings. Um, and that since mid-September when the border opening announcement was made, it's become pretty much exponential. In terms of where the USA is sitting, you can see that Australians are first looking or primarily looking first for an island escape with Fiji and Hawaii being the top two destinations searched. But Los Angeles comes in at number six, New York at number 10 on a world scale. This means that the USA has three of the world's top 10 destinations searched for. And when we break down search for just US destinations, we can also see significant demand for Las Vegas, San Francisco and Orlando, all of which I think is a great sign. One of the most resilient travel companies during the pandemic has been package company Luxury Escapes. And the weekend following our Prime Minister's announcement that we would be open on November 1 was their biggest trading day in history. They turned over almost a billion dollars in annualized sales with their phones and systems melting down with people desperately wanting to buy a holiday. So the market is indeed hungry. We have a hugely important and exciting task ahead. And we're really looking forward to working hand in hand with our media and trade partners and with you to help facilitate this education, to bring back the inspiration and to drive people to your destinations as quickly as possible. Our work, ugh, I've never felt like my work has been more important. Our work is just so important and really how effective we are in getting this, this confidence back is, is really going to impact on, on all of us. Um, biggest challenges, we need to be cognizant of, you know, the fast changing needs of the media and, and our travel partners. Um, they're short staffed, they have a lot of historic intel gone, they have tighter budgets and they're going to need our collective partnerships and assistance more than, more than ever before. So please know that we're here to help. We're here to assist wherever we can. And we're really looking forward to working with you all to drive the revenue and kickstart this market back to life. Thank you very much. I would, with that, like to stop sharing my screen and um, introduce you to Jody Teakin, who's the head of Qantas Airlines Marketing. Thank you so much, Jody. Hi everyone, thank you for your time today. It's so nice to see everyone on the screen there. Just let me find my screen, it won't be a second. Put it on presentation. Okay, are we good to go? Great. Um, so firstly, just wanted to take you through, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with Qantas Airways, but quite exciting this week, it was actually on, on Tuesday, we turned 101. So last year was our centenary in the middle of the pandemic, which we unfortunately missed, but happy to be 101 now. So we are Australia's largest domestic and international airline. We fly customers from, we've got 65 destinations now across Australia and New Zealand that we can fly people from Australia and New Zealand to the US via Sydney and Melbourne. Um, we've also got half of Australia's population are members of Qantas Frequent Flyers. And we're very proud to have been flying to the US since the 1950s. It's changing the all over my pants. Hi, boy, girl. Oops, sorry, is everyone on mute? Just getting a bit of feedback there. Um, so, as Joe Jody, mentioned, Judy, can I, Judy? So I'm so sorry to interrupt you. You yeah. know, your presentation is an on presentation mode. If it's possible, just because it is quite hard to see the typeface, is oh. it possible to put it on full screen? Um, okay, let me try again. It was on full screen on mine, so let's. Oh, sorry. Let's give it another go. 
So that's probably means when you're sharing, if you just share one screen instead of two, that might be why. Have you got two oh, screens in front of you? Yeah. When you're, select, when you're selecting the screen that you share, if you just share the one. Okay, sorry everyone, let me stop sharing and we'll try again. Okay, bear with me. Here we go. Oh. Now it's not wanting to work at all. Let's try this. How's that? Yes. That's that's okay. Perfect. Awesome. Yes. Don't Great. we love, Thank you. Our, love our technology? <laughs> <laughs> so um, as Joe mentioned, we're now flying back to Los Angeles, which is wonderful. And um, Los Angeles was actually the first destination, the international destination we flew back to. And very closely followed by Honolulu. And then we'll have Dallas. Fort Worth and San Francisco in the new year. Um, actually, before I move on, so I think key points here are, as Joe mentioned, Australians absolutely love the US and I know they're definitely looking forward to heading back in the near future. We've absolutely um, seen from a Qantas perspective that Australians are ready to travel internationally again. Um, we've seen a lot of pent up demand over the next few months. We've actually seen specifically flight searches to the USA increase by 150% over the past month, which is great. And we are back, we're ready to go. Um, we're going to be back to our pre-COVID network, in fact, by April next year. So that's also exciting. Um, as the national carrier, we know that we have a really key role to play in driving tourism as well. And so we've invested a lot of our time and effort into supporting the opening of borders. You saw our flyaway campaign that Joe showed you earlier, which is absolutely, you know, we're so proud of it. And it's really done its job in getting Australians ready to, to travel again. So I'll just show you here on screen just some of the things that we've been doing at Qantas over the last little while. So we know we have a very big job ahead of us still needing to stimulate demand, support our customers through a different travel landscape. So we're really focused on a lot of education, inspiration, building confidence, and really supporting some of our key programs. You can see them on the screen. One of them is Fly Flexible. And this one will be very important for customers traveling internationally again, because this program actually allows you to book your flight, but have the confidence that you can change your travel dates as many times as you need to um, over the course of the next 12 months, so that if anything happens, you can be free, change your flight. So we'll be pushing that quite hard to get people to book to the US as well. Um, we've got our travel inspiration programs um, called Travel Insider. So this is delivered through both our Qantas in-flight magazine and digitally across our ADMs on our website, through social media. And its you know, key role is to provide inspiration and editorial content and all the travel ideas about where to go and what to see in the USA will be a big part of that. And obviously I'd be completely remiss if I didn't mention that you are, anyone on the call is more than welcome to sponsor any content in that platform as well. So we'd be happy to chat if your destinations are something that you want to focus on. Um, also, we're just so excited to be flying internationally again. It's funny the, the buzz and the pep in everybody's step now in Australia as we're actually open and ready to go. So very excited to be bringing Australians back to the US as well. And that's it from me. So I just want to thank you for your time today and Look forward to coming back to the US very soon. Thank you so much, Jodie. It's great, great to hear um, that. And I know, yeah, everybody, everybody on the call is so excited that you're back. We needed you. <laughs> we so are much. back and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, with that, I would like to introduce Tim Holden, um, who's the business leader, product design, supplier relations and tourism partners from Flight Centre Travel Group. Thank you, Tim. If you could start sharing your screen, that would be awesome. No worries at all. Can everyone see this? Yes. Yes, thank you. Awesome. 
Um, great to follow on from Qantas, one of our close partners that we love um, love working with from a flight centre uh, travel group perspective and um, also keeps the colour of the slides the same, so it makes it nice for everyone watching at home. Um, I guess, sorry, that has just decided to do something fun for us. Let me continue on. Um, my role here is just to give a bit of an overview on kind of a story that we have had over the last two years. And the first thing I want to say is thank you and congratulations to everyone for being here right now, because it's been just such a hell of a two years for, for everyone. And it, it's so nice now to be at the stage we are. Um, that's really odd. Um, forgive me, is this, yeah, here we go as this keeps going. Um, yeah, it's just been such a ride for the last two years. Uh, the key part from Flight Centre is we've been lucky in the fact that we're a global uh, global brand and we operate in a number of different leisure markets around the world. So that diversity has kind of given us a sense of confidence for, for this journey over the last 18 months that I'll take you through now. Um, Joe, I might be going to plan C here if this keeps doing this. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Plan C um, on hold. I can... <laughs> Do you want, I'll, I'll get ready for plan C if we need it. No worries. Um, I guess the COVID effect from us, from a flights in the global perspective, we were a $23 billion business with a profit of 3.4 a year. Um, with the COVID effect, that went down to 4 billion. Joe, can I get you to jump on the slides here? I'm not sure what's going on with the computer. 100%. Here. Yeah, 100%. You, and I'll, I'll keep talking to the slide anyway. Um, and I'll just zoom yeah. in on that. And you let me know when we're ready to. If you want to. If you unshare, then I can share mine. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. Sorry, team. Always fun. Um, yeah, so the flight center journey, we, we are a global business um, in lots of different countries, which has given us confidence for, I guess, from the pathway when COVID first hit, but it certainly hasn't been easy. As it, with a turnover, as I mentioned before, just on that next slide there, if that's okay, okay. Joe, um, a $23 billion business down to $4 billion turnover, um, profit going from $3.4 billion to making a half billion dollar loss. Um, the key part for us was that we did have a big cash runway and the directors of our company are passionate about travel. So, so we were always going to survive. It was what we were going to do about it. So the Australian story for us was we had 880 shops pre-COVID and that got reduced to 365 shops. So that was a massive reduction for us. But when we did the analytics on it, those 365 shops, 95% of our customers are still within a two kilometer radius of one of our shops. So we had too many. And it was part of the strategy even before COVID hit to reduce the number, not by quite that by that, quite that amount, but it was part of the strategy to change how we, we did growth, which I'll talk to next. Obviously, 80% of our business is international, which um, the United States made up a large part of that, which I was obviously flipped to 95% domestic. That last 5% international largely being repatriation and actually bringing people home. From an Australian perspective, we've gone from 10.8 billion to 1.8 billion in turnover. Um, and our cost base was 220 million a month, and we've had to reduce that to, to 65 a month. So a lot of people as across the whole network in Australia, New, Ze New Zealand, it's, it's basically been a, a war field out there of a lot of friends and partners and just, just losing their jobs. And it has been really a tough 18 months. Um, so that's why everyone is so excited to get to where we are now. The positive story is we have had a growth in market share over that time that I'll talk to a little bit more. Joe, if you don't mind hitting the next slide, that would be fantastic. Um, so our, our strategy was first, we need to hibernate. We need to understand what, what the effect of this COVID is. And that was bringing a cost base down so that we, we could continue to exist um, and also make sure that we look after our customers, being present, looking after their refunds. As you can see on that screen, um, we've given $1.4 billion back in refunds and basically everything that we've been able to get from partners has gone straight to customers. Um, so out of the COVID reimbursements, you can see 55% was a straight refund, but the, the exciting part for us that Joe touched on is 37% is still worth travel credit. So there's a lot of people out there with travel credit ready to go, ready to book. And that's what we're excited about now. Our next phase was to reimagine. Um, and so in the reimagining phase, it was what are we going to do next and how are we going to focus on that growth? Three key pillars for us was e-commerce. It's something we haven't done as well as we should have been doing in the past. So we need to be smarter in our analytics. How are we seen online? What's our pricing like online? How do customers engage with us online? We need to be better in that space. So we've invested heavily in the e-commerce space. 
premium and luxury, as you also saw in Joe's um, presentation, is one of the key markets going forward. This is largely serviced by our Travel Associates brands, but it's also understanding the high value customer for all our brands has been a real purpose. So that, that's been a real trigger for us. And that last part has been certainly one that has been an opportunity out of COVID, and that's the flight center travel group independence. There's a whole lot of um, really experienced travel agents out there that are moving away from, um, from their old brand alignment and want to operate as themselves as entrepreneurs. We call it the house of entrepreneurs or hotties. And, and these are all the independence agents up there that need the support of a big brand um, for their product sourcing and also help with marketing. So that's been a big part of our growth. On the slide here, I'll note that our, our previous way of growth was literally building, was bricks and mortar, building more outlets. And now those are our three pillars. So where we stand at the moment, we've got the Flight Center brand that um, if you've worked with us before, that's just probably the brand you understand the most. This is a mass market targeted brand. This is where we um, target as many demographics as we can. We take irresistible deals to market and it's very high volume based. Our Travel Associates brand is our premium brand. So it's making sure that we're really taking care of those premium customers. The product is non-commoditized and it's a, it's a real luxury focused market. We've got the My Holiday brand there that I guess um, to reference previous presentations is the competitor to the likes of Luxury Escapes where it's very much a packaged brand. So it's very much about choosing a date, packaging it up with as much value as possible and taking that product type to market. And then our fourth strand I just talked about is our home of the travel entrepreneur. That's those travel partners um, all around the world that want the backing of a big brand. And that number has doubled the number we have just over 500 involved in that side of the business, 500 different outlets, where before even pre-COVID, that number was less than 260. So that's doubled and has been a huge growth area for us. Um, next slide. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, technology has certainly been one area where we've really doubled down our investment. So for our consultants out there, they were literally touching about nine different systems to make one booking for our customers. So one of the key parts during this COVID and uh, reimagining phase was how do we make that easier? How do we increase our conversion? How do we make uh, the customer experience shorter and, and less painful, as well as making things easier for our consultants? So we have doubled down on this and we've come up with the travel box, which um, enables a number of things, one being efficiency. And on the next slide, you'll see as well, our reporting is so much better. We now get live reporting, um, like yeah, live reporting that basically tells us what's performing, what's not performing, what do we need to change so that any message we take in the market, we're actually more dynamic than we've ever been before. And we're seeing some real success in that as well. Um, next slide, thanks, Joe, thank you. Um, so I guess the key point I guess I'd like to make is it's been a horrible two years. Um, the Qantas video is outstanding because it really captures what a lot of people have been through. We've, um, we've, all, we've all lost kind of, a lot of people have lost family members and missed funerals and missed weddings and missed catching up with friends in a separation. So now that we are in a stage that the world is opening, there's a real excitement in, in Australia at the moment about people traveling. And we're seeing that in our metrics. Our goal is to hit 500 million per month uh, revenue by next August. That's just been changed, literally, I found out two days ago to, to hit that by February. The reason that is the target is that's when we'll be back in profit. So that's our break even number there. We found with international search at the moment, it's up 600% from October versus September. So with these announcements lately, with the vaccination rates increasing, the international search used to make up 8% of what we see, and now it's making up 54%. People are interested in traveling overseas and the USA is one of our key markets. So this is really exciting for us and, and should be really exciting for you as well. In terms of books tickets, um, the month on month growth is insane. It's 63% um, from October versus September where a lot of the announcements have been made and 250% for international. Now, the reason that's impressive is, is now's the time where a lot of Australians look to book their Christmas holidays. So the fact that international is trending so high it really goes to show our customers want to go overseas. From a, from a company perspective, we've had seven businesses return to profit, which is really exciting for us. Um, so it goes to show there are really green shoots starting to take off. From a, um, a flight center travel group perspective, um, we're excited by the fact that 
customer sentiment is 30% more travelers will now use travel agents. No one wants to deal with seven different bookings chasing refunds if something did happen. They want to deal with one person. So that's exciting for us that more people will be using travel agents, which means our customer base is growing. Um, we've had an 18% increase in brand trust with the way that we've uh, dealt with refunds and supply credits. So that's exciting for us. And again, another really green shoot. And our market share has increased massively from 8% to 25% online. That's comparing pre-COVID to current and 30 to 35% offline for the Australian market. Our brand awareness is also seeing at 80%. So from a partner perspective, we really feel we're in a good position to be talking to customers and giving them really great product offerings. Um, on the next slide there. Um, so the plan, our plans for the USA, there's a lot of detail on the slide that you necessarily don't need to go through yet. This is something that Joe's team and we are working on. But for our key brands, we have an always on um, aspect where literally we've got our, our, our own channels. We've got 1.1 million um, targeted consumers uh, through our EDMs. We've got almost 2 million on our social platforms. So we've got an always on strategy where we want to be talking about the States because we know it's a key destination for us. We'll also be doing campaigns. We'll be doing, looking to do one to two per year. We're going really heavily with an inspiration phase for a start, as Joe mentioned, really changing the rhetoric around all this negativity around travel and international travel and how hard it's been, we really want to tap into that inspiration phase and building that dream again. And we believe Qantas has done a really good job in that as well. Um, so, so we'll be doing we'll be doing a two to four week inspiration phase and then following that by a four to six week campaign. Travel um, for the flight center brand that will be very much targeted by destination for the Americas. Um, for the travel associate brand, they'll be doing that by theme. So being that premium market, they very much target into um, food and wine or adventure and then wrapping the destinations into that. We'll be giving more detail on this over coming times. The other, other ways we can help your businesses grow is we have a number of different teams within our business. We've got the learning platform ensuring all our consultants out there have the most up-to-date the information so that when a customer comes into the store, they can book it. So there's a team dedicated to training those agents. We have comms that is um, a communication platform that's instant. So as soon as anything changes, um, our consultants have that information first in hand. Um, we have teams dedicated to driving sales and centers, driving for mills, drive, um, focus nights. And we've also set up a team we've called uh, Marco Polo, which is our COVID hotline, I guess, with the um, number of international destinations um, that are opening up at the moment and, and borders changing um, and requirements changing. And it could differ from state to state. We've got one team that is across that all the time. So we're making sure that our consultants have the most up-to-date information so that when they're talking to our customers, um, that we can really capitalize on that. So I've, I've sped through this. I guess the key message from us is we're excited. Um, we're in the wheels up phase. Um, all the metrics we're seeing are that customers want to travel overseas. The United States is one of our most popular destinations and we're really excited to help people uh, see the world again. So. We really look forward to working with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. That was brilliant. Um, fantastic. Well, now I would like to hand it over to the very lovely Paula Watson from House of Travel in New Zealand. Um, Paula, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Sure. Thanks, Jo. Thank you. Let me bring this up. Kia ora, everybody. Hey Paula, thanks for joining. So I'm the commercial manager at House of Travel. Um, I've been with House of Travel for over 10 years. So House of Travel is the largest 100% New Zealand owned um, travel retailer in the country. We've been operating for over 30 years and currently still operate over 60 agencies across the country. We love being in local communities and have a successful owner operator model meaning the manager in store owns 50% share with our House of Travel Holdings. So this has played in our favour over this very challenging time for the industry, where we, like everybody, has had to scale back our business over the last 20 months. It's allowed us to secure financial investment, and from that we've had added three new people to our board and two new shareholders, which come from different industries, so it's giving us a really fresh look into our business. 
now that we come are coming out of hibernation um, and into our rebuilding phase, we are working hard on our marketing initiatives and how we can open up the world again and start showcasing the USA to our customers. We live, breathe and dream travel and believe better holidays are made together. So we can't wait to get back to doing what we are known for and that's enriching people's lives through travel. So we have our businesses in New Zealand and across Australia, we do own Hoot Holidays, Travel Managers, which is the broker network and Orbit World Travel, which is the corporate arm. But out of adversity comes opportunity. So House of Travel has made a long-term investment in our, retaining our strong retail footprint. We have a significant presence within our local communities and we continue to invest in our future. Retaining the largest retail footprint, we're well positioned to rebound and re-emerge as the dominant retail travel business in New Zealand. Our foundations are not bricks and mortar, but our people and the relationships that they have with their customers. So the heart and purpose of our business will always remain the same. So we're still operating over 61 retail agencies across the country from Whangarei to Invercargill. And so you can see on the map how that's spread out. So we're really happy that this has still been possible. We have remained relevant to our customers. So when borders reopen, our customers have advised that they'll look to us as travel experts who have their back, provide flexible options, know what they're talking about, and provide 24-7 care and support. Over the past 12 to 18 months, we have continued to connect our brand and our people with customers through our Holidays at Home program, which was introducing domestic travel to our customers. We did that through regular EDMs and our Journeys to Come layer, which is creating inspiration, FOMO, and bookings for 22 and beyond, despite our borders in New Zealand remaining closed at the moment. We've remained, um, we've continued to have an uh, engaged EDM database, um, and we're attracting new customers at pace. So 54% of customers who booked with us in 2021 have never booked with us before. So a good agent has never been more relevant. And we'd surveyed in September and over 75% of our customers who responded were keen to travel internationally in 2022, as soon as borders are opened. So through that research, we found out how Kiwis are actually feeling about future travel. So we had 5,056 responses and 75% are keen to book in the first few months following a New Zealand quarantine free travel announcement. It obviously reduces if there's self-isolation as a requirement, but we are hoping like Joe said earlier that this will come sooner than later that we hopefully go quarantine free. But the best part out of that is 26% of our hot customers highlighted USA as their preferred destination. We've had proven results with the USA in the past. We've had proven successful success partnering with suppliers and tourism boards as an exclusive conversion partner, supporting large scale brand and content campaigns and executions. Our 2019 NZME and Brand USA campaign, where House of Travel was the KDP for a two month campaign, is an example of an integrated multi-channel campaign with a focus on education and inspiring travel as well as a tactical approach with exceptional results. We had 23 million digital impressions, 189,000 leads measured through click-throughs, and an increase of 17% in USA sales. We also increased our wallet share, so 3,500, over 3,500 per person, um, an increase of 12.6% average per person spend. But in addition to the 93% of customers rating their experience with us a five out of five, over the past year, we have continued to invest in technology to improve our customer experience and ensure we remain relevant in the digital age. Ensuring our, custom, our consultants are sharing the latest travel information and updates is in an easily accessible portable, critical to comfort, customer confidence. We've also invested in a new booking tool for our retail teams to bring through 
better efficiencies across the business because obviously we have scaled down and there's less uh, consultants per store now. So we're ready at House of Travel. We're just waiting for the borders to be announced and just have that confidence um, in actually how the traveling is going to happen next year. Thank you. Fantastic, Paula. Thank you so much. So House of Travel have been trad traditionally, I'm using the word traditionally, um, one of our biggest partners in the Australian New Zealand market. We've done extensive promotion as, um, as, as Paula described there. So thanks so much for that, Paula. That was a really comprehensive update. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to you, Susie. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the panelists and Joe. That was amazing information for everyone. Um, so I will open it up to questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask directly, or you can put it in the chat if you don't feel like chatting. Um, I think one question that came up for me just while, you know, people um, decide to put questions is that Joe and, you know, all the panelists said, there's this pent up demand coming and flights are booked out through December. So because we know that people are booking already, when would be the right time to do marketing here in Australia to make sure that you're getting that incremental visitation and not really marketing to the people that have already decided to come to the US? When would be the best time to start? Now, I think like, to absolutely now, but basically I think the key to that, if, if, I, if I can take this one, I think the key to that is demonstrating with the people who are going now and coming back, demonstrating that it's as frictionless as it can be, that it's as fun as it can be. We just want to flood inboxes with positive content. Um, and I think that that really is the key, even as ourselves as seasoned travel professionals, you know, I've got amongst my team, we've got the first fam departing in a couple of weeks well actually I think it's in like 10 days time and it, there's a little bit of nervousness it's like oh what do I have to do have I ticked all the boxes so it's vitally important that we um that we use this first wave of of the first movers to demonstrate um uh, to everybody who's holding back that actually it's fun it's going to be fun and yes there's a few extra protocols that we've got to go through but apart from that we're hoping that what we prove is that it's a relatively normal process and of course the the key reasons for traveling are still there that it's really um, a deeply enriching um, experience so i think the, the the sooner we get that process started and the more aggressively we get that process started the more likely we are to bring those that you know that the next from the first movers forward um, at the moment, it seems to be that people are relatively confident from July onwards. You know, remember that curve in that in that graph? You've got the early movers and then you've got the sort of, you know, the bulk of the bell curve. Um, to bring that bulk of the bell curve closer, we just need to build confidence. And that is going to be, it's like the, the, the visual word of mouth, um, media, influencers, agents, friends, family. The more people we can get um, sharing that message, the better. Is this first wave, Joe? do you think it's just mainly VFR or is it people actually taking leisure time to go over to the US? Um, well, there, there is some leisure, but it's that early move is, again, it's that bell curve. Um, I think VFR is a big part of that for sure. Um, but there are some people like amongst my team members, you know, day one that you could book, they were booking, you know, they were, they were booking deals. So it depends on the psychographics of the people. Um, those early movers are the early movers, um, but to get, you know, the other 90% of the population traveling again, we really have a lot of work to do in just building that confidence. The desire is there, the money is there, it's the confidence we need to be demonstrating. And that's where I think every single person on the, on the call here um, has a role to play. Like the more that the quick, the more quickly we can facilitate journalists, agents, you know, just getting, coming, experiencing it firsthand, publishing their stories, getting that content out, um, the stronger a position we'll be in. Um, Joy, I had a question about um, the types of products that we're hearing are being booked. Um, you know, there's been a lot of chatter, obviously, about 
being in wide open spaces, enjoying the, the natural beauty of the outdoors in the States, which of course you can do in so many places. But um, what I'm hearing, and this is more from the UK and Europe, is that the bookings for the gateway cities is as strong um, and, and the, you know, Vegas, for example, is doing super well, I'm glad to report, but, you know, it's, it's, and obviously you can do both when you go to Vegas, you have the outdoors and you can have the inside attractions as well, but, but it is interesting to see that perhaps that was a little counterintuitive to what we were all thinking, that people would want to be outside, you know, really, um, and, um, but, you know, City says New York's doing really well. Um, just there's a, there is a really high demand for that city experience. Do you, do you think that that translates into the, into the Australian bookings as well? Um, I, I'll, I'll start by answering that. And Tim, if you've got anything to add there, Tim, or, or probably Paula wouldn't have started just yet, but Tim, if you have anything to add, please jump in. But I would say historically, it, it, it's too hard to see yet because it's only been a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. So I don't think we could necessarily have it. From those um, search um, results from Expedia, you can see that it, there, there was a good cross-section of US destinations being searched for. But I also drew back on, you know, the vaccination rates are high and people were not wanting to be in cities because, because of social distancing. But, you know, once you're vaccinated, you're in a pretty mm -hmm. position with that. And then also historically, the key point of difference that the United States has to Australia and New Zealand is the city experiences. You know, we yeah. have wide open spaces in spades. And yes, we love doing those things when we're in, in the US as well. And, and yes, the demand for those things is increasing. But still, the fact remains that the key point of difference that the US has um, compared with Australia and New Zealand is these big city experiences. And I think that's why you'll always have you know, Los Angeles, Vegas, New York, um, your Nashvilles, your, um, your, your Portlands, but you, all these like interesting, diverse cities, San Francisco, that people are definitely always going to want to include those um, because it's what's most different from here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Corey just said, um, mentioned, that's a great comment, Corey. Thank you so much that the feedback from the ski wholesale partners is increased demand and bookings yeah that's that is really positive that's great good point i can i can just um support what joe's saying there as well i think the um while that those specific kind of product types are trending it's certainly not a mutually exclusive of uh, those yeah. those days will always be big um for the australian customer and i think the key point to note is that Australians go there for a long time. So it's not like they're choosing one or the other. It's just that they're probably more open to building more experiences into these. So yeah, we're, we're certainly in, in our product market, we'll be certainly looking to, you know, really feature those kind of key city stays as well as incorporating those kind of national parks, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. I have a question. Um, I was wondering, you know, you have controlled uh, COVID so well, and my concern is once people start traveling to Australia and you start seeing breakthrough infections, uh, is that going to ruin all the plans? Are they going to close the borders again? Has there been any talk about that? I think the, I think the key here, Liliana, is that we've had 90% of our populations had their first dose of vaccine and over 80% has had double dose. We're a, we're a vaccinated nation. Um, and interestingly, what you just said um, is scary is actually what we've been living for the last three or four months, or maybe four or five months. So once <laughs> Delta came out, you just kind of couldn't hold it out. Um, and that's very true. We all went into lockdown, <laughs> you know, right at the tail end of everything, we've sort of come out of actually our hardest period and, and our strictest period. Um, and look, obviously it all remains to be seen if another variant comes out who knows, right? Not all of us are in the same boat there, we don't know. But I do believe um, that one of our really significant fundamental strengths here is our extraordinarily high vaccination rates, because it literally does mean that, you know, um, we're kind of immune to a degree. And, um, and that um, also it means that we, our entire population is a target market and is able to travel. 
um, as opposed to having that restriction of, you know, only, if only 50% of our population was vaccinated, well, only 50% is the potential target market. So I think we're in as strong a position as we could possibly be, um, notwithstanding the fact that goodness knows what a virus can do and how it can morph. And um, Craig, you, you raised your hand. Please feel free to ask a question. Yeah, this was um, a question more so, I guess, for Flight Centre and House of Travel. Um, a number of US hotel chains and cities have released uh, hotel health and safety programs um, about making the hotels COVID safe. Is that going to be something or that you feel that your customers will be kind of wanting to know about or something that you'll be looking at when it comes to actually packaging up hotels just to ensure that there's that kind of information and that product is put out to Aussie and Kiwi customers or do you feel they're not interested? No, I think, I think um, Tim here from Flight Centre, mate, it's, um, it's a fair point and it's certainly the reason we've started that Marco Polo team. We need mm -hmm. to be aware of everything that is happening um, and we need to be the most informed uh, for our customers because they're trusting us for their travel. So it's absolutely something that we need to be across. And I think um, we saw it in the Qantas presentation, the House of Travel presentation and all the Flight Centre presentation, flexibility is key for our customers. So I know it doesn't directly answer your question, but a good time to talk about it as well. Like every product we take the market we need to be aware of what those restrictions are we need to be aware of the protocols and we need to have flexibility built into them okay. thank you yeah, that answer, mate? yeah um, it was, i guess it was not so much about the flexibility there's health and safety in terms of the hotels a lot of them in the us have these a lot of like really stringent health and safety cleaning and procedures um, and some hotels are not in that program so what i'm trying to ask is would some of those hotels you feel be, be more interested in featuring those more prominently because they're meeting certain COVID standards that they might be more attractive to your customers. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's more around um, their cleaning, the operational procedures of the hotels and whether that would be of um, interest to our customers because I guess they might be at a higher standard than others. Is that is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, no, I guess I'll answer it. The more information, the better. So we, um, we, we believe that the more information, the more informed the customer is, the, the better experience they're gonna have. So absolutely, yes. Um, I, I think the confidence in the vaccination that we have, and the reason I talked about flexibility is there's two parts to this question. One is, is that gonna be a driving force for the customer to choose one hotel over another because of that? Well, what we've, in, what we've seen is, is, is probably yes, because it's gonna be a safer place to be. Is that gonna be the number one driver of that customer choosing it? Probably not. So from our brand perspective, it's having the information there and easily accessible for the consultant to pass on to the agent, but not necessarily something we'd push out in marketing as a, as a key driver. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's just, obviously it's different because obviously in Asia, that's the kind of inquiries I'm getting from the trade that that will feature prominently in packages. And I just, wanted to see if that is a concern yeah. or a focus for you guys in Australia as well. Yeah, our procurement team are very much on. We've got, um, and, and yeah, and I know a lot of um, other operators out there like Flights to Travel Sam, where we have different preferred statuses of the products that we actually use. And that's certainly something that's done at that sourcing and procurement stage, but not necessarily something that needs to be an emphasis on the communication to the customer stage, because we should be covering that off with the products we actually take to market. Great, thank you. No worries. Yeah, we have the same, I mean, I have the same sentiment as Tim, to be fair. Um, I think we've seen it a lot when the Pacific Islands have opened because they've actually been closed, that people have been a little bit more concerned about because the hotel has been closed for so long, what's the kind of condition of the hotel and then what's the procedures around the protocols uh, with the COVID. But I think, when customers understand that countries haven't actually closed, so like mainland USA and Hawaii, where there's still been business happening, they're not as concerned about that as much. But a, a lot of people will just jump on your website, on you know hotel websites as well. So as long as all the information's in there, I mean, we'd be the same. It's done through our procurement and then it's not something we'd probably need to highlight more um, in the advertising side of it. Does anyone have any more questions? 
It was such a thorough job from all the panelists and Joe. Yeah. So much great information. How about uh, plans for the Visit USA roadshows? Is February too soon? Uh, I believe, is anybody, is, um, is Lucy on? I don't think so. Sorry, I'm just seeing it. Um, I believe that Visit USA, I hope I don't get this wrong. If I get this wrong, please, and anybody knows that, please tell me. But I believe that Visit USA is doing um, a, the, a Sydney-based show that also has virtual components um, in January, which was originally scheduled for earlier this year, and they just postponed it to, it's the end of January, Craig, right? Do you, I believe that that's right. So, yeah, January, February, a hybrid, and then, yeah, because it'll only happen in Sydney. That is the working goal, I think, at the moment. In asking um, the retailers and wholesalers, um, because this is such a period of onboarding, um, and while they do desperately need the education, they're also really short-staffed. So we believe probably from April onwards is a better time to um, roll out things like missions where, um, you know, people need to dedicate chunks of time to coming along. Um, so if that helps to answer your question, I think these first couple of months, while it's desperately needed, there's also just not the scope for it. It helps. Thank you, Joe. Great. Well, I think we can wrap up then, um, if that's it. Um, please do remember this has been recorded, so we will be putting it up on the Global Marketplace and you will receive um, an email with the link to it as well. Um, thank you again to all our panelists, Joe, Jackie, thank you for being here. And of course, all our U.S. destinations, thank you so much. We really hope that this is helpful for you as you start building out um, your plans for recovery and definitely include Australia and New Zealand in them. So Jackie, is there anything else you want to? No, oh, just thank you very much, guys. Great panelists, really wonderful information. As Susie said, just super thorough. And um, I, yeah, I, I almost want to go back and re-listen re to everything again. Um, so it, it was really great. So thank you very, very much. And and thank you guys um, to our US partners for joining us tonight. I know it's it's almost 7.30 now in, on the East Coast. So I um, really appreciate you staying with us. And thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, everything. everyone. So nice to see you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.